Today I'm sitting with my new friend Tim, Tim Buxton, who's visiting our D'Antonia community with his wife Sarah and your four children, right? That's correct. Yeah, Tim just got here yesterday and we spent the evening as a community hearing from Tim about the work that he and Sarah are involved with here in Australia, but also their journey that got them here. And I want to start with a question for you guys watching this, and that is when you hear or see refugees, what do you think? What do we think when we see people less fortunate than us, people who have been displaced, moved from their homes for any number of reasons? What crosses our minds and hearts when we hear that there are 100 million displaced people in the world right now? Those were some of the things Tim was inviting us to think about last night as a community. Tim tells us that when the world sees refugees, he sees waymakers. So let's start with a simple question, Tim. Yeah. And good morning, by the way. Thank you. Um, what has made you change your perspective on what a refugee is and what is the work that you're engaged with now to further that? Well, great question. Um, and it's obviously something that um, I kind of love to share with mm. people about this new perspective of seeing refugees in a different light. It wasn't until I moved to um, Iraq when I had an interaction with an older man who had fled with his family that survived mm. the ISIS genocide. Uh, we had provided some simple shelter for a, f a group of about 20 of his fellow family. He pulled me aside, started making motions to cutting his throat and grabbing me and handing me his cell phone. And I quickly got someone to scurry over and try and help understand what, what was he so like, obviously with agonizing anguish and, and pain trying to communicate to me. And it was his daughter yeah. was um, captured by ISIS and he had caught, got a call from ISIS to say, will you give us $12,000? They're asking for this money to be able to rescue our our daughter, my child. And, you know, I felt hopeless and immediately, you know, my wife and three kids at the time were just a few kilometers away and I just immediately went and thought to my own children, what would I do if I knew that someone had my daughter? And I knew in that moment I would do whatever it took. I looked at, suddenly looked at all of these families and I realized these families are survivors. They have fled together. They've kept their family together. They would do whatever it takes. Mm. And when I look at refugees that are displaced for no fault of their own, just for being born in a certain country or being where a natural disaster has taken place, when they move from place to place, they are finding a way, they're making a way, they are way makers ultimately. And if I saw them in that light as these courageous, resilient, incredible human beings, then maybe I wouldn't look at them in the way I've been taught or the media has been taught me to look at them, to be afraid of them, to be to, to, to be the ones that is taking my jobs. Or So it was that interaction really that changed everything for me. And it's obviously since that moment has set me on a path in my life where I just want to dedicate you know, my life to, to empower these waymakers, to give them the same opportunities that you and I take for granted. So there's a lot in what you've already just said, um, but one thing you kind of just glossed right over is when my wife and I, with our three kids, ended up in northern Iraq. I mean, yeah. who does that and, and, and why? I've always had this, you know, upbringing I'm grateful for, just like maybe many in your community, to be surrounded by people that are dedicated to, to living a life that serves um, the vulnerable around mm. us that, that wants to be true to the ways and the teachings of Jesus who lived his life for the least of these that, and have parents that, that modeled that. I was born in Indonesia in the mission well, field. My wife had a similar upbringing and um, I met her just after she'd returned from a few years in Africa working with AIDS orphans. And so it's something I can't say I mustered up myself. I was just shown that example. And, um, you know, moving to Iraq, was it, it wasn't you know believe it or not it took my wife three years to kind of be the one to actually say we're going and so i kind of went originally on a on a trip and came back saying you know sarah i think we're we're called to serve this part of the world people think you can't go there and i've been there and you can and i said will you pray about it and she said no <laughs> <laughs> you know for the first six months she didn't even want to pray about it i mean the thought of it like many of you would think well i'm willing to kind of do certain things but kind of go into a war zone country just doesn't seem and with like children too. yeah it doesn't seem like the wisest thing and but 
finally she had this incredible dream and woke up and said, Tim, we've got to go. And wow. I was like, okay, well, let's go. And I've learned something that day that when you go together, no matter what obstacles you face on that journey, um, we were able to kind of push through some pretty difficult times and we were able to, I guess, survive that shock of, oh my gosh, we've moved here the same day that ISIS has moved here and, wow. and managed to, to be able to be in that community for three and a half years serving at the peak of that crisis. Also, I was very interested um, listening to you last night describe the micro communities mm. of, of these families that, that you came to know and love and talk a little bit about the difference in that model um, mm. from the idea of a refugee camp um, as we might be, you know, envision it or think of it in the UN context to what you experienced with people actually living in a form of community together. I don't think like the value of life in community is lost on you mm. and, and those in the Bruderhof communities especially. You understand the importance of being able to share and, and live and work in, in that context. We discovered that families fled together mm. really because they lived in community where they were from. They're, unlike more the Western model is you get married and you move as far away from your family and your parents as possible. There they move into their family's homes and their neighbors are their, their brothers and their sisters and their, their cousins. And so when, they, when war broke out, they would flee together as those collective groups. Usually around 20 to 30 families would often be okay. fleeing together. And if you piled all of those groups into a, a one major camp, sure within that 20,000 camp, let's say, that existed in, in Iraq at the time when we were there. Wow. Quite quickly, I mean, they, things, things would break apart. There would sure. be chaos and, and, and some of the trauma that they fled from, they'd experience more trauma living inside mm. a refugee camp. It's not a sustainable way to care for those that, for no fault of their own, have fled. And so we realized, let's keep these family groups in, in, in the community that they fled with and provide them uh, the dignity that enables them to be able to care for themselves um, the way you and I would want to be able to care for our families if we fled. So if they have their own, ho their own home where they had, could sleep their family unit mm. in, in a room and their own kitchen and their own bathroom and, and had that dignity and then collectively they would, you know, if one had a job in the community that they were able to work, they could provide for those that weren't able to get get income at the time. And we didn't need to pay for a security guard. We didn't need to p provide them their own food. They were able to kind of be self-sufficient and self-sustaining because we gave them that dignity yeah. to, to care for themselves. So uh, when it comes to coming back here and starting the organization, you belong, you know, realizing that what people need ultimately in life is that core sense of belonging. And that's what community offers. How then do we offer that to people who come into our communities that are so different from us, that might have different beliefs, mm. that have, that look different, different cultural practices, um, and as we're discovering, you know, like there's so, so many people with different skills and ways of perspectives of seeing the world. We've been taught, I think, a lot in the West, in Australia, and, and even in places like America, to feel threatened by that which is different. And we believe the lies of the media that people that are coming to our countries or seeking safety want will, will come to destroy our country and we've got to be afraid of them. I think commandment for us, really, that we see in the life of Jesus is to welcome the stranger. Mm -hmm. And I would say this, not see it as we're trying to help you, but position ourselves, what do you have to teach me? So just listening to you, Tim, I, it feels almost like you belong, the organization that you founded here has a two-pronged mission. One, to help empower and make families that have arrived as refugees feel at home in their new surroundings. The other, to help those of us who are already here be more accepting. Can you give us some examples of how this actually works out? You've explained that exactly. I would say we're 50% okay. <laughs> serving those in the community that need empowerment and 50% serving the established Aussie community and other communities around the world, how to be more welcoming. And our, one of our first initiatives we did was a welcome picnic. You know, we invited all those that had newly been settled like in the last three months here in Australia in this one particular town that we were working in Toowoomba. And we invited the local community together. And it was pretty much like 400 people showed up, a couple hundred former refugees and a couple hundred from the community. 
and we celebrated together. We just threw us a picnic and we had their food spread out on the floor right. in their traditional way. And then we had the Aussie, you know, what we call Aussie taco, or I call an Aussie taco, which is like your, your sausage and bread, right? And then we did their cultural dancing and music. And then we did the bush dancing that, Sweet. you know, is kind of colloquial Aussie dancing. <laughs> and, and we just integrated, right? And so what that gave was a space. Mm. And then we can learn about them and they can learn about us and it's all centered around relationship. And once you get to know somebody and their story, you grow with empathy and care and concern for them. To that point, mm. when you were in Iraq, how did that go at the beginning? What, what did you find replaced spoken language as your tool for connecting? I would often say one of the greatest gifts we did experience there was bringing our family there. Mm. Our children were the doorway into the community because one, they realized, wow, like you really do love and care for us yeah. that you're willing to it's bring trust, your yeah. children here. Yeah. And secondly, I mean, children, I think there's a reason why Jesus said you have faith like a child. Yeah. Children don't judge the way we judge. Uh, they make friends really quickly. They play, they, they just are. You know, and I think we, we can, I mean, my, my goal in life is just to be the biggest kid <laughs> there is on this planet. I always tell my kids and my teachers because they, the way that they, they live and the way that they love is, is just so with no strings attached. Is there a particular verse in scripture that keeps you going, that inspires you, something you want to leave with our viewers? And finally, if people are inspired to support in any way, what's the best yeah. way of them getting in touch with You Belong and the work you're doing? Maybe start with that part. Yeah, thanks. I was going to. That's great. We have a website, um, youbelong.org.au, um, and there's ways that you can support us financially. But one of the best ways I think you can get involved and I would, I would tell people is love your neighbor. It's that simple, like... And that complicated. <laughs> throw, throw a street yeah. party. Yeah, brilliant. You know, just... Um, like you said, uh, there are no strangers in the world, only friends to be made. Mm. You know, if there's refugees in your community and you feel drawn to that by listening to this, um, just go visit them, knock on their door. Um, you, you have, it's that easy. Mm. Uh, they'll welcome you in. So serve in your community. Um, and if you feel that, uh, we'd definitely very much appreciate um, the support um, to help us continue our programs and their work that we do. And the verse I really, you know, it's been with me for a lot of my life. And it's the Lord is, is near to those who are brokenhearted. Mm. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And I don't know about you, I want to be where God is. And if God is near the brokenhearted, if God mends and heals those that are crushed in spirit, that's where I want to be. Because I've got some healing that I need to do in my life. And I've got, and I want to, I know that happens when I'm near in his presence. And I want to, I want to be near and around those people. So um, that would, that's what drives me. Um, the joy and the, the gift of being able to be with God is being with those that, that are, that have so much to teach me Amen. in that space. Amen. Well, friends, thank you so much for being with us. And I hope you found this conversation with Tim uplifting. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please uh, like and subscribe. And we look forward to catching up again real soon. And Tim, blessings on your family and on your work. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. What a joy. Ahead. What a joy. Thank you so much. It's been great.